So good afternoon, everyone. Just going to wait a few seconds for everyone to join us from the waiting room and then we'll get underway. So good afternoon and welcome to this EPC update, our regular look at key developments in and around the European Union. My name is Jackie Davis. I'm a senior advisor to the European Policy Centre and with me this week, as always, Yanis Emanulides, the EPC's Director of Studies, Fabian Zulig, the Chief Executive. Uh, and our special guest, we are delighted to welcome EPC Senior Policy Analyst, Amanda Paul, as we discuss this new and very dramatic phase of what the EPC has coined the PERMA crisis, the crisis sparked overnight by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and its ramifications, both in terms of the geopolitical crisis we face, but also its ramifications for the EU and some of the internal issues it is wrestling with. As always, this will be a totally interactive session with questions from me to our speakers and also I hope from all of you. And if you do have questions about what's happening, take advantage of the expertise, of particularly having Amanda with us this afternoon. Please do keep those questions coming. You can click on the raised hands button and I will allow you to talk when the time comes or you can put your question in the Q&A box. But can I ask you please to be as brief as possible? Um, so let's get underway. And Amanda, um, Ukraine's foreign minister uh, said after the news broke of the invasion, the world must act immediately, the future of Europe and the world is at stake. And he called for devastating sanctions and help for Ukraine, both in terms of military equipment, but also financial aid, humanitarian aid. There is an emergency summit tonight, unprecedentedly in an incredibly short notice, EU leaders are flying into Brussels for that emergency summit. What is on the table? Is Ukraine likely to get what it's asking for? Thank you, Jackie. Um, I think that the decision that the EU is going to be making today is going to be one of the most important in its history. Um, personally, I'm actually quite disappointed that these sanctions haven't already been prepared, given the fact that we knew such an invasion was likely. Um, but coming to your question, um, I think that the sanctions will aim to hit strategic sectors of the Russian economy um, and military for example, blocking access to technologies and markets that are key for Russia, um, the banking sector, blocking and freezing assets in the EU um, that stop Russian banks from accessing financial markets, more individual sanctions on Ukrainian and Russian, uh, Russian oligarchs and their assets. Um, also possible um, sanctions related to Russian industries such as insurance and transportation, um, I'm not sure about where we'll be on the energy sector, um, but these sanctions, I mean, in my opinion, should at least be as painful as those that were placed on Iran. Um, no Russian oligarch or Kremlin crony should be left unsanctioned. I think that banning Russia from SWIFT should happen. Um, it seems to be off the table, and I think that is a mistake. This I also think that... This is the international payment system, and there's been talk of it, but as you say, it's yeah. ebbed and flowed, the discussion. Yeah. Okay, and just, just very lastly, I also think that Belarus needs to be sanctioned uh, for its complicit involvement because it's allowed Russia uh, to carry out this invasion or part of this invasion from its territory. And, and Amanda, your sense there was... Uh, seemingly up until yesterday, a degree of division. I mean, the, these sanctions have been months in preparation, ready for this moment, but there had been a lot of discussion about what the trigger would be, what would be defined as the moment to hit harder and harder. That all seems to have changed overnight because of the nature. This is a declaration of war. It's clear it is a full scale invasion. Do you therefore anticipate that those countries that had been more hesitant about going hard uh, will now fall into line and that we will see relatively quick agreement among the EU27 to go for this very tough package of measures? I mean, frankly speaking, there should be no question about them falling into line. This is a really serious situation. It's not a time to start thinking about, um, you know, personal economic um, blowback on individual member states. I mean, this is the, um, we're talking about the security of Europe, we're talking about the reputation 
um, of the European Union. There needs to be an immediate and quick and extremely hard hit hitting response that is going to have an immediate impact on Russia. And do you think there will be? Is your sense, is your sense of the mood that now everybody's ready to, to go along with that? Yeah, there has to be, Jackie. There has to be. I mean, yeah. it's unthinkable that we're going to spend hours and hours discussing and, you know, arguing over what can be put and what can't be put. Absolutely. And Fabian, uh, you have just published a commentary uh, ahead of the summit this evening. You call it decision time for the European Union and you have five calls to action at today's summit. Can you just briefly uh, outline and please do take a look at that. It's already been published. It's on the EPC website at what it is you want to see from the summit today. Sure. Uh, I think um, firstly, uh, just to pick up on Amanda's point, um, I think this is really a watershed moment. It is a moment when Europe has to stand up and be counted um, because what is at stake goes way beyond uh, what is happening in Ukraine on the ground at the moment. Uh, we shouldn't forget that that is a tragedy and that this is really affecting the lives of the people there. So I'm not in no way um, belittling the, the effect which is there. But we also have to look beyond that. We have to look at what is the European response. Uh, we know we're not going to put boots on the ground, but there are a number of things we can do. Um, but we also have to be prepared. And there are some of the areas where uh, this is really time to rethink what we are doing uh, in the European Union. Um, we have to be ready for the implications of uh, this invasion. Um, that means, um, for example, being proactively ready to deal with the refugee question. Uh, undoubtedly, there are going to be refugees. And I think it is very likely that we are going to see a weaponization of that by Russia. Um, and we need to be ready to deal with that in a way which also shows that we deal with this kind of issue together rather than leaving it up to the individual countries. Mm. Uh, we have to deal with uh, the shortcomings we have had in our defense and security thinking. Um, we have to make sure that the commitments we have made in NATO are actually being fulfilled. That we are not always talking about what we are going to do next without actually doing it. Um, and that means also rethinking in some countries of the way we have dealt with Russia in the past. Uh, to put it very briefly, appeasement does not work and we will have to be more decisive. Um, we will have to think about the European defense sector in a very different way um, and actually do things jointly. Um, but we also need to prepare, and this is, I think, a very worrying sign uh, that uh, for the moment, yes, it is Ukraine, but it will not stop there. Uh, he will move on. Uh, he will test our resolve uh, in many different ways. And we need to decide now how we strategically react to it. And finally, I think we also have to be sure that we deal with the consequences of that, the economic consequences. Um, if we want to have sanctions uh, which are meaningful, they will also hurt us. So we need to prepare how we deal with that. We need to prepare how that impacts on our gas sector, how that impacts on prices, how that impacts on growth. Uh, all of these things need to be done now. And very, very importantly, we have to jointly do it. If we end up with the individual countries going ahead, not showing the solidarity, not showing the cross-border measures which are needed now, then we'll end up in a situation where what we're doing is not credible and Putin will win. Okay, we'll come back on those consequences in all those different areas you've mentioned uh, in a moment. But just to be clear, Fabian, I mean, that is a, a huge task ahead of us. In immediate terms, uh, EU leaders at their brief summit this evening, this emergency summit, they can't do all of that now. What signal, what, what's most important for you, apart from the actual package of sanctions, and you've talked and Amanda's talked about how tough they need to be, what are they, what's the signal they need to send from the summit? And then I'll come to you, Yanis. Well, one of the key signals they need to send is unity. It is that we are not fragmented, that the strategy of Putin to divide and conquer is not working. 
Um, and I think uh, while the uh, areas which I've just mentioned are far reaching and they will take time, there is nothing to stop European leaders from um, declaring today that they are going to do this, that they are going to move in that direction. Uh, they then will, of course, really have to follow up on what they promise. Um, but just making those statements, showing that there is that resolve, showing that also leaders in Europe have recognized that this is a watershed moment and that things will be different post this moment than they were before. And I'm uh, very disheartened to hear uh, that there are some reports of people fighting around uh, whether the uh, export market for diamonds or for luxury goods is going to be affected. Because if that is the level we are going to come out of the summit tonight, then we really are losing this uh, information Absolutely. war. Absolutely. Well. So, so Yanis, this, this point Fabian made about that symbol of unity, that divide and conquer won't work. Uh, it is striking to me that in an age when EU leaders could meet virtually, we now have the technology, they're meeting at incredible speed after the invasion last night. They have chosen to come together in person for this meeting. How significant, how important do you think that is? And do you believe that we will come out with the sort of measures and that display of unity that both Amanda and Fabian has underlined is so important? Or are you concerned that there may be cracks already as, as Fabian was alluding to there? Well, first of all, I think it is, um a necessary sign that they're meeting in person. Um, it is about showing face. It is about looking into each other's face um, in the room when they will be meeting, also because there are some who might have been skeptical up till yesterday at least or last night as to how far uh, the course of measures should go. So looking into each other's face is significant, but also showing face to the world. So meeting in person, I think, is the right thing to do. Um, and that starts from the assumption of, you know, today is, is a sad day. It's a sad day for Ukraine. It's a sad day for Europe. But it's also one of these moments where things potentially can change in every aspect of different policies, different regions of the world in Europe and beyond. So it is this watershed moment. And you need to signal that, that this is not just another crisis. It is something which has the potential to change everything. So them coming in person, I think, is a strong signal. Yes, there were these differences. There have been these differences among member states with respect to how far to go when it comes to sanctions. But I think after what happened tonight, after what's happening as we're speaking, as we're sitting together here, I think it's a different ballgame. It is something where the EU27 um, cannot afford not to be united. So my expectation is that they will find an agreement with respect to much stronger sanctions, strong sanctions. I'm not sure that they will go all the way. And they might also, and there are some member states who are arguing this direction to say that we should leave some additional measures to be added in a next round. Um, also when it comes to sanctioning Putin himself. Um, so there are things which might not be agreed to fully today, but I think that they will try to send this strong signal of unity and they should because it's necessary. And that Amanda, I mean, that is a legitimate uh, debate, is it not to be had about, um, do you go, do you use everything in your armory right now? Uh, or do you say, we hold back a bit in the hope that it can be reversed. I think I'm getting a sense from you, no, you, you need to give it all barrels because uh, that is what Putin has done uh, by the nature of this invasion. But also you said earlier you were disappointed that it took this to come up with this package. But the fact that this package is ready to go, as it were, uh, it has been prepared, it's been very carefully planned and we do expect that it will be agreed tonight. Um, does that not show that the EU, uh, at least the mechanisms have been working uh, to get to this point where now that it's happened, the EU can act fast? Can we take, do you take any comfort from where we are now in terms of, of the EU's capacity to respond to such a grave crisis? I mean, I think you're, you're right that the mechanisms have speeded up, that there will be a package that is agreed tonight. Um, but I still think, I mean, for me and for many people in Ukraine, um, there is a disappointment that these measures weren't already um, announced this morning. And when we go back a few days to the beginning of this week, I mean, the, 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 sanctions, pa the sanctions package um, that was put um, a couple of days ago was extremely weak. 
So, I mean, I'm one of these people that believes now is the moment to put everything that we've got on the table. There's no reason to hold back on anything because frankly speaking, um, for Ukrainians, the situation really can't get, get very much worse than what it is. You know, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians are fleeing the country. We have no idea if in the next half an hour, five minutes, or maybe one day, President Zelensky will still be sitting um, in his office. Uh, there's a very high chance that when the Russians arrive in Kiev, which they will do almost certainly, um, they will go and um, take over the presidential building, the parliament and whatnot, um, in the event that they can't um, get the Ukrainian leadership to agree to a deal. I mean, President Putin has asked for a conversation with Zelensky, and this deal would be for Ukraine to adopt uh, a neutral status. I mean, this is not going to happen. Could I just, just follow up on one point with you, take advantage of your understanding and expertise here. President Zelensky made an extraordinary speech uh, in the middle of the night, appealing to the Russian people over the heads of Putin, question how many of them will have actually been able to hear it or, or listen to it. Is there a chance is, in your reading of the situation that Putin, the, that there will be a sense that Putin has gone too far and that either population or the oligarchs who are going to be hit so hard could begin, could this be as some are saying, he's overreached, this is the beginning of the end for him. Do you think that is possible or is that a very over optimistic reading uh, of what the outcome of all of this could be? I mean, I don't think we'll know that until the tougher sanctions are put in place. Um, when the Russian cronies, the leadership, the oligarchs, everybody really begins to feel the, the severe pain. Only then will we have a sense whether this is going to be the end um, of Putin or not. I mean, the guy the, the guy has a has a way of you know going on and on. Um, hopefully we might be heading into a, a, a turning point at some point, um, but that's definitely not for sure. He could keep going for many, many years. Um, but at the moment, I mean, the, the focus needs to continue to be on supporting Ukraine, shoring up U Ukraine any which way we can. Yeah, thank you very much. Just in terms of in the run up to today, uh, Yanis, and how the EU has played this. I mean, we saw those frantic efforts. We saw Emmanuel Macron, with that very lengthy meeting with President Putin, trying everything, trying all the diplomatic leaders. We saw Olaf Scholz uh, also trying. We've seen the EU collectively trying. What is your assessment of, of the efforts that were made? And, and some will say, well, they failed, so they shouldn't have tried. Others will say, no, it was right to make the effort. They did the best they could. And this did show the EU stepping up to the plate and playing the role it needs to play in the world. What is your assessment of how the EU performed, notwithstanding where we've ended up, uh, in, in the run-up uh, to the invasion yesterday? It all depends on when the starting point is. If you're talking about the last couple of weeks, the last couple of months, it's a different story than we talk. If you think about, you know, where we have been eight years ago in Crimea, when we had the annexation of Crimea, and whether we then took the right lessons, and we didn't. We're finding ourselves in a situation now because we didn't take the right lessons, because we didn't prepare for the moment which we are now in, or we weren't ready to or able um, to stop this from happening. So there is a severe historical mistake which we've committed over the past 10 years at least, probably even longer. But what you were referring to was the last couple of weeks or months. And I think that, yes, it was right to go and try your best to convince Putin not to do what he, has, uh, what he is just now doing. However, uh, we saw how much he fooled everyone who was sitting uh, across the table, um, talking to them for hours, um, and then there being some hope that things could be stopped, that the worst could be avoided, and that what we are now seeing would not happen. All that failed. Um, but was it a failure to go? Was it the wrong thing to go and try to convince him that this is the wrong path to engage in? No, I don't think that this was a failure. It was the right thing to do. Whether the right lessons were drawn out of these meetings and whether you were then um, uh, sure that what would happen would actually not be an aversion of him uh, doing or implementing the plans which he's now implementing is another story. So it was the right thing to do, but at the end of the day, it didn't help um, because in the mind of Putin, he was clear what he wanted and he was fooling all of us and everyone yeah, who was perhaps, saying that he's doing that was right. Perhaps going back to Fabian's point about uh, having to 
explain to the public why what you called appeasement, Fabian, uh, it cannot be part of the answer. That was important that the effort was made, that, that people tried and now it's failed and you can see uh, that it's failed. But I wanted to ask you more broadly, Fabian, you talked about unity. Uh, at the beginning and how important tonight is for that display of unity. Also unity across the Atlantic. I mean, in terms of uh, the EU-US relationship and how they've worked together on this, both sides stressing all the time, with our partners, with our allies, we will do this together. Um, how effective do you think that dialogue has been uh, across the Atlantic? Uh, and can we draw anything from it? And I'm thinking also similarly here uh, in terms of the EU and UK. This is the first major foreign policy crisis since Brexit. Um, has there been the level of coordination, collaboration, cooperation uh, that there needs to be? Or are there grounds for concern there as well? How do you read those two? Um, I just to, to respond a bit on, on the previous question as well, because I think it's linked to that. Um, I think we, uh, of course, need to analyze what happened. But the reality is we now are in a different world. Mm -hmm. And we have to respond to that world as it is now. And that means that we have to also recognize what is happening what is behind it and what the character is which is involved here. We're talking about a geopolitical bully who will keep going until he's checked. Um, now in that context, I think it has been positive that what you can broadly call the Western Alliance, like-minded liberal democracies have actually worked together. Uh, and just as a side remark, I am very glad, um, despite the difficulties of this moment, but I'm certainly very glad that we don't have a Donald Trump in the White House at mm. this moment in time. Um, but yes, there has been effective coordination. There has been uh, also the involvement of the UK. Um, certainly when it came to sanctions, there was a very quick uh, response. Um, but looking ahead, we will have to do much more of this we will have to strengthen this alliance further and we have to make sure that there's also consistency across the whole alliance in how we deal with this. Mm -hmm. uh, that applies uh, to the UK, for example, when it comes to how does the UK now deal with the oligarchs? How does it deal with the Russian money which is in the system? But certainly the UK is not the only place where that is an issue and where we have to address it in the EU as well. So it is now, a constant dialogue. It is also, and this is going to be a major challenge, um, for example, on um, refugees. How many refugees are the UK going to take within this context? Because that is also part of the response. Uh, how are we going to strengthen NATO? How are we going to strengthen cybersecurity? How are we going to strengthen intelligence sharing between the Western allies? Mm -hmm. All of that will have to happen. So. While there are some positive signs, uh, there is so much more which will have to come now as a response to this. Mm. Uh, Amanda, a reaction to that in terms of that, that uh, working together of allies and, and Fabian there talking about the Western Liberal Alliance and saying, yeah, it's held together, it has been coordinated. Just two words about the role of China in all of this and where Beijing might find itself or sense. I mean, it's been broadly and loosely, it was easy to be broadly supportive of Putin until now, but this runs up against some big challenges for Beijing itself in terms of sovereignty and, and, and independence. Uh, your reading of, of the alliance and how well it's working, uh, and, and two words if you can on China. Um, can I first say just one word about energy security? Yeah. Um, if I might, because we haven't actually touched on it yet. Now we're going to come to all those issues in a moment in terms of the, the, the repercussions of all of this, but please do. Uh, I was going to say that, I mean, this is the weakest link um, for the EU because we've been extremely foolish um, years and years after a number of other energy crises where Russia has weaponized natural gas. Um, we're still far too dependent on it. I mean, you could say that EU money um, is helping finance this military campaign against uh, Ukraine. So this should be a top priority to as soon as possible really diverse away, diversify um, away from, um, from Russian gas. I mean, that's not easy, but it, it can be done. 
um, if the necessary political will is there to really take the steps quickly. Mm. Um, on your question about the alliance, um, I mean, I think if when we're talking about NATO, um, they have shown um, total unity um, in their response uh, to this uh, to this uh, war and the crisis before it. Um, there hasn't been any voices um, with a different perspective. Even some of the countries that have sometimes been slightly problematic have stuck to the same line. So I think uh, NATO has done um, a good job, but obviously much more needs to be done. I mean, immediately um, strengthening the, uh, the defences uh, and the resilience of the eastern flank, this is crucial. And we saw that earlier today, um, this decision was made by the Allied Command uh, to allow the eastern flank from the Baltics down to Turkey uh, to be strengthened. Uh, this is crucial, but I mean, I think it's also important, something what Fabian mentioned earlier, is that all NATO states, you know, start to pay what they should be paying um, into, into NATO because I think that um, there's been far too much reliance on the United States. So this should act as a wake up call that each country needs to do um, much more. Okay. Uh, and in terms of, of, of China, can anybody help me on that point? Uh, Yanis. Let me refer to a couple of things here. With respect to the EU-NATO, I think we're seeing that when it comes to the Russian crisis, there is a strong alignment between both institutions. And the fact that you see uh, Stoltenberg, von der Leyen, and Michel standing next to each other and expressing the same opinion, I think is a strong signal. So you see uh, how close the alliance NATO and the EU are when it comes to this issue. Second, with respect to China, I think that we see that there are, what is uniting them is that um, the wish to change the international order as it stands. And that is something which is uniting them, but there is also something which is very strongly dividing them, which is the question of sovereignty. And the fact that you now have an argument in Moscow by Putin, who says that there, is, uh, that there are parts of the country which uh, want to be sovereign and we support that, is, and they call for, and then supporting their independence is something which the Chinese exactly want to avoid because of their internal situation in certain parts of the country. So here they're very much divided. However, when it comes to challenging the existing international order, they are supporting each other in that challenge to the existing order. Um, but, and the last point I want to refer goes back to something you said earlier when you were asking about what um, the strong signal should be coming out of the summit. And Fabian was correctly saying and referring to unity, but I would add something else to this, which is that there is a need for EU leaders to tell people, the citizens of, of the European Union, the truth of what the situation now means. And that whatever you decide in terms, for example, of course, of measures of sanctions, that they will be painful, that they will be costly, mm -hmm. that they will be something where you will have to bear costs. And you need to send that signal to get people behind what you now have to do at this moment in time and in the upcoming period, which could last very long. Mm -hmm. um, because all those who were saying, we can find a compromise, there's a way to find a compromise with Putin, we're proven wrong. So now you need to follow a different track and you need to make sure that you have citizens behind you. And that's a task and a signal that needs to be also sent out by today's summit and subsequent summits, which will, which will definitely follow. Fabian, you want to come in. If you do have any questions or comments to what you're hearing, please remember you can put them in the Q&A box or raise your hand. Fabian. Uh, I just want to add two important words to unity and truth. And that is solidarity. We have to be in a position where we also make sure that the negative impacts of this are cushioned as much as possible. If we get into a situation where the distributional consequences of this are such that certain countries suffer disproportionately more from what is happening than others, mm -hmm. then that unity will disappear extremely quickly. And um, that, for example, you mentioned the refugee crisis earlier, very important to support front -line on the refugee country. crisis, but also on gas, exactly. on the yeah. economic impact, on the, um, the military impact, which is going to be there. We have to carry this burden together and we have to recognize that in all of that, some countries are much more able to do that than others. And those countries is... will have to step up to the plate. Yes. And the other word I wanted to add is leadership. 
we have a responsibility here. This is about the future of the international order. This is about security. This is about democracy. And we have a responsibility of our leaders to step up and make it clear that what is happening now leaves us with no other option. We have to act decisively now and we have to act in a way which makes sure that we protect our principles, our values, uh, and that we will continue to be in a position where Europe can make choices, can stand up to these kind of geopolitical bullies. This is really a critical moment. And uh, I sometimes have still the feeling that at least some leaders don't seem to quite recognize yet what kind of a watershed moment this is. Mm. Um, it is starting to sink in, um, but we really need to hear this right across the board. And we need to hear that some of the petty squabbles which were there beforehand have no place in this. We have to act decisively now. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you want just, to one, just one point to support what Fabian was saying with respect to solidarity. Um, if we look back over the last 10 to 15 years, and we were looking at different chapters of the Perma crisis or the Poli crisis, we were always asking ourselves, what are the lessons learned from these crises for the future? And I think one lesson we should have learned, and I hope that we've learned, is that when we talk about solidarity in these kind of situations, the best way of thinking about it is in terms of enlightened self-interest. So it's not about supporting others just to show within the European Union, especially those who will be hit by by economic sanctions stronger than others, um, to support them just in order to show support and to show solidarity with them. It's in the interest of all of us that we support each other because if we're going to be tough when it comes to economic sanctions on Russia, on Putin, that also means that there will be huge costs which have to be bared and we need to support each other to then stick to the economic sanction we will impose. I want to, to move now to some of those consequences, and I want to come back uh, on the point Amanda was making about energy security. When we first uh, wrote the invitation to you to this event, we entitled it Inflation in Russia, because it seemed that the big issue that we might be talking about now was indeed the energy price spike, the impact this is having, the cost of living crisis and what it all would mean. We, of course, are now in a very different world where we are talking about much, much bigger things. But nevertheless, this economic impact, you mentioned Fabian, the economic recovery from COVID and the impact there, the pressure, uh, inflationary pressures and the pressure on the European Central Bank that will come now to raise interest rates. Um, how do you, what can be done now? Uh, Amanda pointing very strongly there to that point about diversification of energy supply. And we see already Germany after canceling Nord Stream 2 beginning to talk about those issues. I'll come back to you in a minute, Amanda. But what needs to be done now uh, in terms of mitigating that impact uh, because of the, the enormous pressure, the cost of living crisis that so many families across Europe face, particularly as we're struggling already to recover from the pandemic? I think uh, clearly diversification is a key part uh, of the response. Um, we will also have to find ways of using less energy. Um, we are very dependent on energy in part because of still unsustainable uses. But we have to, of course, recognize that uh, these kind of measures take time. It is not something you can do overnight. There are some things which can be done quickly. Um, we have to also look at how can we bring in, um, for example, LNG um, from other places. I mean, this is going to be part of the response. But uh, what that also means, and uh, we've already heard warnings from some of our leaders about this, is that we will have um, a negative impact, uh, further negative impact on gas prices. Um, mm -hmm energy will become more um, expensive. What we will also see is uh, spikes. Um, I think this is something we uh, really need to look out for. The volatility of prices is going to increase a lot. What can be done? Um, I think we have, um, firstly, um, to bridge the next few months, thankfully, uh, it doesn't seem to be um, a, a very brutal winter at this moment. 
um, but we need to get into spring. Um, that is already um, one of the, the key things we have to do. Um, but then it is also about cushioning the effect of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my view, what the summit should be deciding tonight is that there will be a package of um, flanking measures which make sure that uh, the worst impacts of this crisis on the most vulnerable are going to be uh, taken when is necessary. That will mean we will have to spend more money mm -hmm. uh, and we will have to intervene in markets much more directly. Um, and we have to do this in a unified cross-border way because we know that some countries can do it and some countries can't. And if we get into a situation where German customers of gas are protected, where they get compensation, where German companies end up being protected from some of these effects, but others who cannot afford to do this are not, then we will very quickly lose any kind of unity we've had. Uh, so and, and do you expect anything of that type at the summit this evening? Uh, or is that going to be, they're going to, you know, they've got enough on their plate to do the immediate sanctions and therefore we won't see it now, but we might see it coming down the pipeline. I think there could already be signaling. I mean, I don't fully expect to have a thought through package, which is already there but a recognition that this problem exists and that there's a willingness to look at this, to talk about it, to address it together, I think is already important. Um, and I would at least hope that it is on the agenda, that there is going to be a discussion around this, um, that there's a recognition that this has an impact on the markets, which goes way beyond the immediate impact, but actually has a, a much more fundamental macroeconomic impact, not only on the European Union. I mean, this is something which will affect um, all of the countries in the neighborhood uh, because energy prices will be rising everywhere. Yeah. Uh, Amanda, you talked earlier about energy security and, and a reaction. And, and, you know, we needed to have done this much earlier. This debate, of course, in Germany, the decision on Nord Stream 2, I'd be interested to get your reaction uh, to that. Uh, and that debate that's now starting in Germany about we need to have more renewables, we need to have more diversification. Some people saying we need to reopen the nuclear energy debate as well. How now? Can the EU act as quickly as possible, taking Fabian's point, it can't be done. It's, it's not something can be done immediately. What do you want to see? What do you hope to see happen now? I mean, first of all, obviously, Germany's decision um, was very positive. But I mean, it took this war um, to get that decision. And that already sends you know, a very bad um, message. Um, we've spent too many years wasting time um, fortunately, you know, we are heading into the spring, not into the winter, uh, as Fabian mentioned. So there is, you know, some time um, to work on ways where we can diversify, uh, where we can improve what's already there uh, and when, where we can arrive at a different scenario. I mean, this is not going to be easy. Um, Russian gas is still coming through our pipelines as we sit here. And it's actually going to be some years before we can actually get rid of Russian gas um, permanently, and Russia knows that. Um, but we need to remain focused um, and not just forget about this six months down the line, which seems to be a problem that's reoccurred over and over again. I mean, there's been at least two major gas crises where it's been made a priority, um, but that priority has changed very rapidly. Hopefully that's not going to happen this time, that serious steps will be taken. And it's also not just about, you know, EU member states. We also need to show solidarity with our partners um, in the Eastern neighborhood who are also dependent um, on Russian gas, who are also um, at risk. Uh, and of course, Ukraine itself. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in Ukraine too in a couple of days. Um, we need to be prepared um, to how the EU is going to um, engage with the population in the event that um, a Russian puppet takes over. Yeah. I mean, there needs to be a roadmap, a plan for this, or in the event that um, President Zelensky, they managed to stay, U Ukraine's in urgent need of economic humanitarian assistance, 
uh, and other sorts of aids. I mean, this should also be a top priority and discussed tonight. Okay. Okay. Fabian, you want to come with a quick one, and then I want to move on to security and defence, if I might, and the implications. Yanis, I'll come to you after Fabian. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say, I think it's important that we recognise that there will have to be sacrifices, that we will have to make trade-offs, that this is costly for us. And that is something we cannot avoid. But if we don't do this in a strategic way, if we don't think about this in the right way, we will make the wrong sacrifice. Um, I think one of the things which already is on the line is, for example, how do we react to energy prices in respect to the Green Deal, in respect yeah. to climate change? Are we going to end up ditching those commitments because it is more difficult? Um, or are we going to find a way of actually supporting those commitments and then also using some of this crisis to create a longer term uh, situation, which is more stable, a better framework, so that when it comes to the next crisis, we are not again in this situation. And this, I think, is, is also a more general point. Um, we've talked about the PERMA crisis before, that this is not only one particular crisis. It is a series of interlinking crises which continue to uh, have an impact on how the European Union works. And we will have to find better ways of dealing with crisis in general. Uh, at the moment, we are still not doing the kind of things which we need to do. Uh, this will have to change, uh, because if it doesn't change, it really is our future which is on the line. But as you say, at risk, it goes the other way and makes people even less likely to do the things we need to do because of all these other pressures. Yanis, uh, uh, you wanted to come in, I think, on this energy point, but then, uh, then can we move to EU security and defence? But on the energy point first. Yes, because you said when we uh, were thinking of today's event, we were thinking that inflation might be a high issue on the agenda and now Russia. These things are interlinked. It's yes. just, it shows how these different thing elements are interlinked. The reasons why we're having inflationary pressures are multiple. There are many reasons which lead to that, including the COVID-19 recovery. Um, and we're seeing now, probably we're gonna be seeing an inflation shock, not only when it comes to energy, but also when it comes to food prices, when it comes to commodity prices. So you will have inflationary risk increasing because of the current situation, and it's not only energy. Um, and when you were saying, what can you expect from this summit? And uh, what signals should it be sending? I think that what EU leaders should be sending as signals is not that they have all the solutions solutions now in place. If you remember the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis uh, in February, March of 2020, it took us until May, July, and the end of the year to get to, um, to, get to the package of we uh, now know um, uh, under, uh, under the word of, uh, uh, sorry, now it misses my mind. Uh, but 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 we, we, it took us months to get to the mo moment where we have an agreement on the multi-annual financial framework. Um, so uh, that's something we're just at the beginning of a severe crisis of this of a new chapter of the of the perma crisis, and it will take us in the, the upcoming months, maybe years, even to deal with it. But you need to send out the right signal at this moment in time. And let's not forget. And we were talking about issues like green populism, energy populism. These are things which are also immensely important politically within EU member states. So if you get this wrong, if you send the wrong signals and you are supporting these also populist forces, you might have problems at home which are linked to what is happening as we speak. So you need to send the right signals at this uh, present point in time. Yanis, could I stay with you for a moment? And just on the question, the commentary says, and I quote, the EU 27 can no longer afford to ignore the indisputable need to take more responsibility for their own security. They cannot, but will they learn the lesson? Will they heed this? Do you expect that this crisis really will lead uh, to a greater sense in Europe of two things, that individually, People need to step up their game. We have this long debate about how much of your budget you spend on defence and what the contribution should be uh, from NATO countries and so on. There's been a repeated plea from the Americans. But in terms also of the EU working together and having a stronger security and defence union, do you think this is the moment where it'll be a watershed for that as well, that, that really people will wake up to what needs to be done? Actually, I don't know. What I do know is that it should be. But it should, have, it should have probably also been in the past. I was referring to earlier to 2014. 
And if you remember at the time, people were saying, this is a watershed moment. it will change international order. Nothing will remain the same as it was before. A couple of years later down the road, when you were talking about crisis situation, there were some people when they were talking about the poly crisis that we always called it, who weren't even referring to the then Ukraine crisis, which we called at the mm -hmm. time Ukraine crisis. So we tend to forget. And there is this huge discrepancy between in Sunday speeches saying we need to assume more responsibility, we need to spend more, we need to be autonomously and more autonomous when it comes to uh, uh, to strategic policy sectors uh, or, or sectors in general. Um, but when it comes to actually implementing on Monday what we have been saying on Sundays, we're very weak. So I'm not sure whether we will get the message, but what is happening as we speak is a strong signal that we have to. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope, I sincerely hope that we will get the lesson right this time around and that we will not be here in a year, three years or five years or eight years time to make a link to 2014 and then say, why didn't we do this when the signals were so strong? So I hope, I also am confident that we will take the right decisions this time around, but I'm not sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Fabian and Amanda, a thought on this. Uh, and then I want to come to another issue linked to this of strategic autonomy, but Fabian first. I think I want uh, to come back to my point about leadership. Mm. And uh, in particular, not that uh, this is the only country which matters, but I think it is very important that we actually see Germany uh, taking on a different role than it has in the past. Um, Germany, for many reasons, has been extremely reluctant when it comes to hard security. And there are historical reasons for that. Um, but we have to recognize that the world has changed and that this is not the end of history. This is something where we will have to respond. And that also means that uh, we have to come uh, true on the commitments we have made. And I think one of the things, um, I'm not expecting that this will happen immediately, but one of the things I think the German coalition has to very seriously discuss and then come out, I would hope, with a statement is on military defense spending um, to finally come true on some of the commitments which have been made in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and as long as um, our member states, and we have to always recognize that the strength of the union comes from the collective strength of the member states. So as long as our member states drag their feet on certain issues, then we are not going to have the decisive response which we need. So Yanis is actually right. There is no way we can say now it is going to be one way or the other. We know in which direction we have to go, but whether we are going to go there or whether we are going to go back to the procrastination, to uh, the narrow national and economic interests preventing us from acting together, that is also a possibility. And it would be, uh, a tragic possibility if that happens. Mm, and it is striking. I mean, also the pressures on the United States, 50% of the American public saying, uh, we don't think the US should play a, a, an active role uh, in this crisis. Uh, therefore, once again, putting pressure and it's bound to translate from the president to in the future, the EU taking more care of its own security. Amanda, your thoughts on this and how much of a difference could this moment make to that debate within Europe, do you think? I mean, this moment should make a difference, um, but when it comes to hard security, I don't think this will happen at all. If anything, it's probably made the countries on the eastern flank um, absolutely more determined um, to have a greater US commitment to their security than before. And I honestly don't mm -hmm. see that changing. And if I was on the eastern flank, I would personally feel the same, whether I was a politician uh, or an individual. Um, I do think when it comes to other security issues, um, building resilience, cyber security, mass disinformation, there is plenty of space for the EU to definitely beef up its role here. I mean, cyber attacks have been almost continuous um, in Ukraine, but elsewhere, they're extremely damaging. The same for disinformation. So these are areas where the EU should definitely be more focused on, again, not just in the member states, but in our partners, because we have we talk a lot about ourselves. Um, we need to think about the Eastern neighborhood and the pressure and the, the attacks. They're under the same sort of attacks um, as EU member states. So we need to also work more to help them. 
Thank you, Fabian, you wanted to come back in on that. Yeah, just um, a quick clarification that uh, I in no way uh, want to uh, suggest that we are moving away uh, from the US when it comes mm -hmm. to hard security. I think this is going to be the future um, as long as the US is willing to bear this. So, but the US they, they has are, a, a political problem. I mean, they have a domestic problem with their public. And we have the problem yeah. of potentially Trump too. And what would be the situation if we get into that? So we also have to start thinking and preparing for that. But I think there is also an element of hard security, mm -hmm. which we can address, which has to do with the effectiveness of the equipment of our armies, um, where we have a very fragmented European market and we have resisted in taking action on that because it is economically painful for some countries. It will mean mergers. It will mean that um, we have a more pan-European market, um, which is much more effective, but is not going to be protecting the national champions in that field. And this is one area we can address um, and we should address. Mm. Janis, you also wanted yes. to come back in. I want to pick up um, what Amanda was saying with respect to if you put yourself into the shoes of uh, someone in Central and Eastern Europe, and you would clearly try the best to make sure that the US presence will be strong, especially after what you see now happening in Ukraine. Um, so yes, she's right on that. Um, but we do not know how strong there will be a willingness in the US. We were talking about Trump too now, and also in future to play that role. But there is something we Europeans can do about that. And that is to strengthen our capacity to act and to assume more responsibility in order to make sure that the US will also, and those forces in the US who argue we need to align ourselves with our, um, with our partners in Europe and support them in their effort and be on their side. So we as Europeans can do something to avoid from uh, things in the US going wrong. And the last point, and I think that's a bigger strategic point. I think what the current situation is showing is that at the end of the day, we Europeans do not have any alternative than to have a stronger transatlantic alliance. Mm. And I'm saying this not only with respect to what's now happening in Europe, but also what potentially might be happening in other parts of the world. And we've had discussions about uh, how the situation will develop between the US and China, how we will be positioning ourselves as Europeans. And I think what the current situation is showing us that there is the best and probably the only choice to be aligned with the US. And that is something which is not only for today, it's for the long-term future. Thank you. Just, I want to come to the issue of strategic autonomy before we close, but in the meantime, Viviana De Monte comes back to this point you mentioned earlier, Fabian, about cybersecurity and wanting to see uh, a commitment and underlining of the need for action in that area. She says, what role do you think cybersecurity will play during this crisis? And more importantly, do you think the EU is currently well-equipped to protect itself from increasing cyber attacks. Fabian. Um, cyber security, I, I think, is crucial. Um, I, I would also um, make a distinction um, between the, the kind of immediate attacks which we are seeing at the moment. So this is not a theoretical threat. This is something which is actually happening um, probably as we speak, and certainly has been happening over the last week uh, in an even increasing sense. So yes, we have defenses, but there is a lot more we have to do. Um, and what we also have to address is uh, the question of how this new media, how uh, these new technologies have been used um, to try to undermine, to destabilize democracy in Europe. So that whole discussion uh, about disinformation. Uh, disinformation. Yeah. The, and again, it is something we have experienced in the past, but we also experience right at this moment. And there's a, a concerted campaign now to try to mislead people about the origins of this crisis, why it, this is happening, um, what the consequences will be. So there, our democracies have to be much better. And we also have to go after the ones in our democracies who are being beholden to this kind of uh, narrative, who receive, for example, when we are talking about some of the right-wing parties, uh, the yeah. populist parties who receive money from Russia to actually do this destabilization Indeed. job for them. And we have to become much more decisive about that. Thank you, Amanda. Quick one, if you would. 
Yeah, very quickly. I also think this is an opportunity to strengthen um, security cooperation um, with some of the other partners in the neighborhood. I mean, obviously the UK, um, but I want to mention Turkey here. Um, Turkey is the second largest NATO member with a huge military and has played a long-term role in shoring up European security um, and wants to do more. But unfortunately, the fact that it's been blocked from a number of um, EU initiatives, including you know, PESCO um, and, and other initiatives, I think this is very counterproductive. Uh, and I do think this should be reflected on when we are considering how we can better strengthen our ability um, to act in security terms Thank you very much. Just wanted to come before we close to the question of strategic autonomy, because again, in the EPC commentary published today, calling for action at the summit, that uh, five calls to action, one of them relates to strategic autonomy, and it says Europe will have to address its vulnerabilities, especially in terms of technology and energy, to collectively find ways of, re of directing significant amounts of investment into critical future technologies. Yanis, um, do you think this changes the debate about strategic autonomy or merely injects more urgency into it? And would you expect a signal to that end? Brief one, if you would, a couple of minutes, and then Fabian, a thought from you on that, and then we'll close. Yanis first. I think both. Um, it is changing the debate because it's making clear even more of what it means to be strategically autonomous. Um, if you have in mind the discussion we've had over the past two years, it often was referring um, to the COVID-19 crisis, which, by the way, is not behind us. Huh? Um, but now we're seeing that it has uh, so many different aspects you need to be aware of. And it goes far beyond the, the mere security aspects of uh, being able to act strategically and autonomously in a world which is so confrontational. And what today's uh, events are showing is that it is confrontational and it will be even more confrontational. So the pressure is increasing and you will see this, this will be a signal which um, EU leaders will be using and will be sending out and will be using it as an argument in order to foster their efforts. But, but that goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Will at the end of the day will deliver? That's another question. Fabian. I think what clearly will change is some of the rhetoric around strategic autonomy. The question is, is that then followed through in terms of the actions we need to take because those actions are also costly. And they will require that we actually do things which are uncomfortable. Mm. Um, and uh, they are, I really think uh, Europe has to be a little bit more honest with itself. We have lost already on some of the key technologies which are going to determine whether we can be autonomous in future. Uh, we have not invested enough. We have not been at the forefront of artificial intelligence and a number of other uh, technologies. And we are continuing to fall behind, even on areas where the race hasn't been decided yet, if we look at something like quantum technology. So what this now needs is that we not only identify our vulnerabilities, but that we now say, and this is how we're going to address them. Thank you very much. I was going to ask you today uh, what we've learned from all of this uh, about the new German Chancellor, uh, about the role of Emmanuel Macron in the post Merkel era, but I think that is for another day. I think personalities uh, is something we will come back to. There is much to digest uh, about what the implications have been, what we've learned from this, uh, but I would like to park that for now and come back to it another day. Thank you very much indeed uh, for all of that, for your insights, particularly Amanda. Great to have you with us. Just to say uh, the commentary that we've been referring to, there is a link in the chat now uh, if you would like to read that. Uh, also wanted to just mention one uh, other publication uh, that the EU has, has put out this week, and this is on the Conference on the Future of Europe. What worked? What now? What next? This is a report coming from the Conference Observatory, which is based on exchanges between members of the Observatory's high-level advisory group looking at where we are now and drawing some initial conclusions from it all. Do take a look if you can. Uh, and looking ahead, and I'm just going to look a little further ahead than I normally do, because on March the 10th, another key area of work for the EPC in terms of rethinking EU economic governance. There's been a task force project working on that, and there will be a final policy dialogue to reflect on that. And we will be back 
in March with another update. So thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, it has been uh, a grim day uh, and it looks set to get grimmer. So I do wish you all, please take care, stay safe, and we'll see you very soon. Goodbye. <laughs>